You can be seated. I, I was, um, I'm going to endeavor to get back on spirit, soul, and body, but, and being led by the spirit. But as we're worshiping there, I was just reminded, um, well, first of all, I was reminded, I think it was John G. Lake that said that lightning in the natural is like the Holy Ghost in the spirit, kind of comparable. Amen. Powerful, right? Powerful powerful. And uh, then I was reminded of, of Smith Wigglesworth. Could you get my, I'm sorry, not to order you around, but I lose my train of thought. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth, at the latter part of his life, prophesied uh, once to uh, Lester Summerall and, and probably others, but he said that at the close of World War II, there would be a healing revival take place. Well, if you do your history, your church history, you understand that, you know, 19, late 1947, 48 kicked off the healing evangelist movement. You can get on YouTube and watch some of them. Amen. You can read about it. Uh, Brother Hagen prophesied, the Lord told him that at the, end, the close of World War II, there would be a, a, a mighty healing revival. And, and it was so. I mean, Brother Hagen lived through it. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth didn't get to see it because he passed away in 47, I believe it was. So it was right at, the, at his passing, this healing revival in the close of World War II. And uh, Brother Hagin lived through it and said it was just the easiest thing in the world to get people healed. It was just a move of the Spirit uh, in that direction. <clears throat> he said that there would be a healing revival. He went on after that and said there would be a teaching revival. I don't know if he worded it exactly that way, but he said, I see people like never before sitting in church with their pens and tablets and writing down what the minister's saying. And that was somewhat, I guess, if you do your, a little bit of a study, before that time, that was kind of a foreign thing. You had your Bible, yeah, and you sat. But then came the Word of Faith movement. Along come Brother Hagen and different ones like him, Oral Roberts and, and different ones, and schools begin to pop up. And they weren't just doctrine schools, were they? Rhema didn't start out as Rhema College. It was Rhema Bible Training Center. And every time I read or, or hear that prophecy by Wigglesworth, and then you watch... Uh, much of any video today on church, people are sitting. He said, I see people with their tablets, with their notepads and their pens writing down. And, and if you watch the camera, you know, scroll how to show the crowd sometimes, and you'll see people sitting, writing down. And, and so there's a, a, a word revival or a teaching revival that's been taking place. But he said, on the backside of that, I see a, a move, a revival of the gifts of the Spirit like the world has never seen. Hallelujah. And I asked the Lord about that one time. I said, how come the teaching revival and how, how do you order? Because you need that teaching of the word to keep you grounded when the spirit moves to that degree. Amen. Uh, in the healing revivals, if you find, you find out why, why a lot of them got off or shut down because they were riding the gifts and not standing on the word no more. Amen. Do you understand that? Uh, some of them went home to be with the Lord because all of a sudden they were working and riding their gift and not, and not standing on the word alone anymore. So he's like, I'm sending, this is my answer that I got, I'm sending that word of faith movement, that, that, that teaching revival into the earth to get people deep-rooted and grounded on the word so at this last move, this last move will be with all the gusto. So then I'm remind I, I, everyone's watching social media, right? And the, the college campuses are busting out in revival. Isn't that interesting? It's exciting. And then just like Brother Hagin said, there's a bunch of wet blankets out there trying to throw, trying to trying to smolder it out. Because there at the Asbury, when you know a devil got cast out, so now we're, there's a whole movement against them. And I want to I wanna just, I'd like to just invite them all to come and listen to me preach sometime. Because <laughs> I want to say, did you read in Mark chapter 16 that those that believe will cast out demons? 
Now, you can get off. You can get off in everything, right? You can get excessed and, and over into steering it yourself, right, Roger? You can begin to steer and start a deliverance ministry. Well, you don't go around, you know, on purpose looking for devils to deal with, no. But when the light begins to shine, the darkness gets exposed. When the anointing hits a certain level, demons will man manifest, and there better be somebody rooted and grounded that knows how to deal with them. Amen. Hallelujah. So I, then I was reminded in 2020 here praying. And the Lord dealt with me uh, the closest I've ever had to an open vision. But I couldn't call it an open vision. Just in, in my heart vision, you know, of a move that was coming. Some things that were getting ready to happen in the earth. And didn't have a clue about COVID. You know, that's when COVID Swept. That's when the devil used that to sweep into the earth and test the church, so to speak, to some degree. And uh, I didn't have any idea that was coming, but I, I, saw, I saw something coming that was going to shake people, shake the church. And then I, I began to see a, a, a decision that had to be made within the body, within the body of Christ. And I was like, Lord, what is that? And I kept seeing the picture of Joshua and Caleb and the, the children uh, of the children. We preached about it several weeks ago. The children of the children, the, the original children that came up to the river the first time, you remember, they had to lay waste and rot in the desert because they were so stuck on stupid, as Brother Philip Slaughter says. <laughs> You know, you've crossed the Red Sea, you've seen the plagues, you've seen all that stuff, you've seen the, the hand of God move in a mighty way, and then you want to throw up a YouTube video because somebody throwed a demon out of a person which was needed and tried to, tried to squelch down a move of God. Amen. So the... I seen that, that I kept thinking, well, we're at the, we're, we're getting ready to cross over into Canaan land. We're getting ready to cross over. And he, he stopped me in that prayer time. And it was like, that's not it. No, that's not it. This is the second. This is the final. I seen it more as the final. They've already been up to the river and they've denied and went back, brought back an evil report. And then they had to die in the wilderness, and this is the second crossing of going into the promises of God, so it's the, it's the last step, right? It's the last step. Here we stand in, in, in this point in time in history, standing in the last step, the last step, and he said, I'm going to make the church make some decisions, and he didn't use COVID, don't, don't misunderstand me, that's right out of hell, and that was a ploy of the enemy, but through that, you will see the church making some decisions from that plan, there's still churches closed, there's still churches that can't open back up because their people all went some, someplace else, and then he needs the Joshua's and the Caleb's. I was talking to my mother, and I was praying, you know, just, you just pray for that, that move in the college campus. Praise God. Man, get filled up, blow up, and blow out for Jesus. I, I'm fine with that. But I said, the church must be able, there must be some leaders, there must be some Joshua's and some Caleb's still left that still had this, enough faith, the spirit of faith, the word established in them when they come out of that revival to help them along the way. Amen. Can we be that? I don't want to be a, a bucket of water. I want to help lead. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I, I believe what, what Brother Wigglesworth and different ones prophesied, I believe it's coming. Coming to pass. Amen. And I believe that there's a, a golly gee, you hate to say it, but there's, there's a, whole, a whole group that will stand back and watch it and call it something else. I mean, I mean, what would they have done when Jesus spit in the clay? What would they have done when, when demons screamed and hollered when he walked around? What, what, what would, how would we act? How would we act, you know, uh, when Jesus walked up and through the, the cities and, and, and some of the things that transpired. 
Can you put yourself there? If you're not careful, you'll find yourself fighting against God. Remember when the, the individual said that the synagogue rulers, they come together and they were coming against the preaching in Jesus' name, coming against the apostles, the early church, and they were just, just sitting down trying to figure out what they're going to have to do. And there you locate a, a lot of churches today. I'm not preaching against them. I love them. Pray for them. But they're, they're, they're fighting against God concerning revival because it doesn't fit their doctrine or their establishment. And that one ruler, remember, he spoke up. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If this is a God thing, then it'll take root and it'll do its thing. And he said, remember so-and-so, they had a following. When, they, when it was over, they dispersed. And so-and-so, they had a following. When it was over, it dispersed and came to nothing. But if this is God, we may very well fight or find ourselves fighting against him. Amen. So we're faith fighters, not God fighters, right? <laughs> I said all that to say, watch your words and watch your lips and, and, and pay attention to what you're listening to. Amen. Because I clicked on somebody and before I was done, I wanted to go get them, <laughs> find them. I said, we need to have a talk because you're trying to throw a wet blanket on a on a move of the Spirit. Amen? All right, enough, enough said. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man, I could go that direction and stay there the rest of the time, but we're going to do this. I feel right about it. This is last week's. We, we, we jumped off of this last week and went to uh, Romans chapter 4, getting ourselves fully persuaded. Are you fully persuaded? That the word's final authority in your life, amen. Galatians chapter 5 talks about, well, I better turn there, hadn't I? I'm talking. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Still not on the right page. Galatians chapter 5, verse says this, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye can not do the things that ye would. Verse 16 again, says, I say then walk in the spirit. Remember two weeks ago I told you that word walk is the same word live. You know, sometimes we ask yourself, well, how do I do that? My good friend Heath, I'll just call him by name. He told me one time, he said, quit telling me what I need to do. Tell me how to do what I need to do. If you know him, that sounds, that's how he talks. He's refreshing to me at times because he, we were talking about things. He says, I don't want to go to church no more and get told what I need to be doing because I know what I need to be doing. Tell me how to do what I need to be doing. <laughs> and I was like, well, I was like, Lord, I left that conversation, prayed. I said, Lord, don't ever let me be a pastor that stands here and just shouts at you what you need to do and never give you a, 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 a teaching or example of how to do it. Amen. Because what do we do? A lot of times we say, you need to be reading your Bible. You need to be praying. And you need to be walking in the Spirit. And you need to be doing this. Everybody have a wonderful day. We'll see you next week. <laughs> right? If we're not careful, that's all we do. So it says here that if you walk in the Spirit, you won't do what? Fulfill the lust or the attitude or the things that the flesh wants. Amen. And you say, so you need to be walking in the Spirit? Well, how do I do that? Well, it helps you to understand that word walk is the same word live. So if you wrap your mind around living in the Spirit, that means that you get up this morning and you endeavor to be Spirit-led. How do I do that? Well, you set your mind and your heart to listen. You set your mind and your heart, or your heart and then your mind, to, to go His direction. You have an attitude about you of what I do today, Lord, I want it to be your will, your way, and your purpose. I want it to be your plan. Amen. If you get up every morning and do those things, if you have to say them out loud, Lord, this morning, this day, I endeavor to walk your way. 
then you'll find yourself living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. And it becomes far easier to put aside the lust of the flesh. Everybody say amen. Amen. (laughs) So Galatians 5.16 tells us to walk in the Spirit, or we'll say it this way, live in the Spirit. And so we have to understand, go with me to Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, These teachings, man, just helped me and my wife Kristen so immensely when we first came here because we didn't know these. I just, you know, I'm not saying somebody didn't teach them to us. If they did, we didn't listen (laughs) or we didn't get them. But uh, as Pastor Bill and Vicki began to teach them, because we were being spirit-led, we ended up in the right place at the right time with the right people. Praise the Lord, it got the revelation of it got to us. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, And if you look at verse 23, the Apostle Paul's writing to this church, and he says in verse 23, he says, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and then we understand that he's praying here because he says, and I pray, and I pray God your whole spirit, and he breaks it apart here, listen, your whole spirit and your soul, and your body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you read that, Pastor Lathan? So you understand. Now you may say, I've heard this my whole life since I've been here. Well, just hear it again this morning, right? Like you've never heard it before. Right here, the Apostle Paul is addressing three parts. He breaks them all apart into three. He said, I'm praying that, that, you, that your whole Say it. It get, keeps you awake. Your whole, your whole. He said, "I'm praying that your whole spirit." And now listen, who he addressed first. He addresses your spirit first. Why? Because he he just he's mirroring what he's writing in Galatians chapter five that he wants you to walk, live, abide in the spirit, be led every day by the spirit. Amen. Well, we're so quick many times to be led by what we see, touch, feel, and hear because that's first and foremost in our life. No condemnation. We've all been there, haven't we? Say, I've been there because you have. If you can say it, then you lie because you've been led by the soul. You've been led by the flesh. You ate the, like I always say, you ate the extra box of Twinkies. You told the person to go stick it in the mud. (laughs) <laughs> Amen. Moving on. So he, he's, tell, he's talking to every part of us here, but he addresses the spirit first. So this might help you. You understand what part of you, your spirit man contacts what part, what part of those three realms? Yeah. Amen. You, the spirit man in you contacts the spirit realm interchanges and inter has react or uh, what would it be the conversation so to speak in the spirit so your your soul contacts the the intellectual realm because your soul is your mind your will and your emotions they're, they're, they're the old southern illinois saying they're they're tighter than two coats of paint they laying right on each other and it takes the word of god to separate the two spirit and soul but that part of you is contacting the intellectual realm, the, the thinking realm. And I, I think this, as I prayed about this this morning, this is why this is such a huge time of social networking. Because the social media is speaking to your, your soul, your, your intellectual realm. And that's the, the, the enemy's using that. My lands, he's using that. Uh, a pornographic material is at the fingertips of everybody nowadays that has a smartphone in their hand. And he's working on your, your intellectual realm to get you sucked into the natural, physical realm to get you pulled into to the sin realm. And that's a big one, but there, there's, there's just across the board. 
in this social media trying to tie up all the space and train you and wire you to be led by the soul. I've seen it real clear in prayer this morning that the devil's using nothing wrong with social media. I'm so thankful that we can get on Facebook and put something on there and contact your friend in California. But, you know, I thought we had something before that that did the same thing called the telephone. <laughs> you know, and you could actually talk to them, right? <laughs> and not just type something. But anyway, you can keep up and you can put all your information on there and people know who you are and who you're with and what you're doing. That's fine if you want to do that. But what it's doing if you're not careful, and I see it in my life, sitting there training your soul to be soul-led. Training your, it's, it's, it's a wiring system that I believe the enemy is using to get you to be so led by the, the intellect, the mind, the will, and the emotions, right? I mean, think about it when somebody types something on there that you don't like. What's it do? It causes your emotions to flare up, doesn't it? And a lot of times, they may not meant what they said or how they said it, but your, your little soul gets tick-tocking and rolling, and it, before it's all said and done, you've turned it in. I tell the story that time. It, was a, it, was, it wasn't even, it was an overhearing. It wasn't a social media thing because it was kind of before that. But I heard something, and I thought about it, and then I rolled about it, and then I thought about it some more. And I tell you my story. When we got home, I was going to call that person and give them my two cents. And that's when my wife said, you might want to ease into that. <laughs> Because you may not be right. So I listened well to my helpmate. Amen. She helped me out because I was getting ready to cause major problems because it was in a family tie type issue. And I was going to call them and tell them, I'll tell you one thing. And if any sentence starts that way, understand that's being soul led sentence. That's mind, will, and emotion sentence. That's not being spirit led. That's letting your soul run wild. And I was going to say, I'll tell you one thing. She said, ease into that. So I called them and I began to ask questions about something as if nothing was wrong. And when I found out the truth, it was far from what I was thinking. So you see how you're being programmed and wired through social media. It started with television and all those things. None of those things. I'm not telling you to go home tonight and throw. Remember Jesse DePlantis preached one time and his helper went home and throwed his mom's TV out in the front yard. He said, that's not what I said. <laughs> so I'm not telling you to go home, grab your mom's TV or grab your husband's TV or whatever and throw it in the front yard and destroy it. But I'm saying you got to be aware that the world system is trying to program you to be completely so led by the soul, by your will, by your emotions and completely contrary to your spirit. Away from it. Just leave him out. Leave him out. Because if he can get you to leave the spirit-led life out and not be spirit-led, he can get you to be far from God's plan. He can get you to be way out here in left field somewhere far away from God's plan. Because you'll never find God's plan for your life being led by your soul. You must walk or live in the spirit. Remember what, I'm on a Wigglesworth craze today, but they told him, one gentleman come up to him and said, uh, you're so spiritually minded, have you heard that saying? You're no earthly good. Have you heard that saying? Or you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Wigglesworth looked at him and said, you're so worldly, earthly minded, you're no heavenly good. Whoa, <laughs> when you turn that around, I bet that guy turned around and said, I need to think about this for a little bit and walked off. I bet he did. He said, you're so spiritually minded, you're no earthly good. He said, I say to you that you're so earthly and worldly minded, you're no heavenly good. What's he saying? He's saying if you would be led by your spirit, you would be walking probably doing the same thing I'm doing, but you're confronting me because you think I'm too spiritual when there's no such thing. There's no such thing. We're not spiritist, as the world says. We're spiritual. We're spirit beings. What do he say there in Thessal uh, Thessalonians? He said, I'm praying for your whole spirit. But he went on. We don't want to leave the other two out. Your whole soul and your whole body. 
So your spirit contacts and, and, and deals with the spiritual realm. Your soul deals with the social and the intellectual realm. And your body deals with what? The seeing, the touch, the feel, the hear, the, the smell. Your body deals with that realm. And you can be led by it. And I've always said it this way, it's very easy to tell it. It's very easy to tell when the flesh is speaking. Because he wants to sleep. Hit the snooze. That's the flesh. <laughs> wants the next Twinkie or box of Twinkies. That's the flesh. Don't want to go to work today. That's the flesh. Amen. That's him. That's his voice. The, the, we can distinguish that real quick, but we, we, this other one, this other one, distinguishing between the voice of our mind, our will, and our emotions, and the voice of God's Spirit speaking to our spirit, this is the one that we must master and conquer. Because I've been there and I've done it. I was like, that's God. Let's do this thing. That's God. And I got out there in it, and it wasn't God. It wasn't God. Man, listen how quiet we are now. It wasn't him. And on the hind part of that, I looked back and I was like, man, I was just being led by emotions. And you can distinguish it and the word of God will help you, but you also, as you walk along, you'll learn. Because you know what my emotions do when I see a revival taking place in Asbury at that, at that thing? My, my soul's like, well, we, Lord, what about us? What about us? Right? And we want to start, me and Roger are talking about this, we want to start steering the ship and it's like, we could just stay for a week. <laughs> and everyone's like, no, I ain't staying for a week. But maybe I could uh, uh, hoist a flag that says, we're going to come to Church of the Harvest, and we're just going to stay until the Holy Ghost, you know, we're going to stay. We're going to have a marathon service like they're having. Do you see how that works? Because I'd love to be in the middle of something like that. Right? Well, we are. If we're doing what God has told us to do in this place, in this hour, then we're right in the middle of that. It may not look exactly the same. I got news for you. If you come here and stay for a week or two, you, most of you just lose your jobs. Wouldn't work, would it? <laughs> but I want to steer it. I, and that's my soul wanting to mimic or mirror. And the soul will do that. The soul will do that many times. Pastor Bill tells that story about the lady that heard, got a, a word from the Lord and heard that she could go home and get rid of her medication for whatever that ailment was, and she did it, and she was miraculously healed. And she gives that testimony, and another lady dealing with the same issue went home and did the same thing. You know what she did? She got in her soul about it. It's just, I mean, it just is what it is because they buried that lady. She didn't get the revelation. She didn't get the rhema spoken word from God to her heart that you can go home, you flush that stuff or get rid of it or however you get rid of it, you get rid of that heart medication or whatever it was and you're going to be healed and she was healed, praise the Lord, and she testified about it and someone heard it, it touched them and it probably moved them and in their soul they's like, I want to steer my ship that way. And they went home and did that and Pastor Bill said they put them in the ground. Went home and got rid of their medication, got rid of it, and within a matter of days or weeks was dead, physically dead. She probably went to heaven. I'm sure God received her and was excited to see her. But I would say he probably had to say, apparently, or apparently, <laughs> that wasn't the plan. That wasn't me speaking to you. That was you getting excited. And it's okay to get excited. I hope I'm not steering nobody away from being excited. Be zealous, praise the Lord, but the zeal is not the anointing. So the spirit contacts the spirit realm. The body, your flesh, contacts the physical realm. And your soul contacts the intellectual realm. And Paul's praying for all three parts of you. So go to Proverbs chapter 20. I'm just going to quote it, I guess. Proverbs chapter 20, verse uh, 27 tells us that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. You ever read that? The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. There it is. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. Well, you know, you're, 
many times when the word of God is referring to your belly, it's referring to your spirit. The center, the most, the, the you. So the spirit of man, he says in Proverbs right here, is the candle of the Lord. So the spirit of man, he's saying, is the avenue by which he'll shine through, which he'll speak through, which he'll work through. Amen? So we understand that if we can be spirit-led, and we can, we can be spirit-led. We can walk in the spirit, or that is to say, live every day in the spirit. Get up tomorrow. I'm telling you, the one that walks every day in the spirit walks every day in success. Every day. Just like, what's the saying? I'm just a, a success going somewhere to happen. Because God is going to lead me into a winning position every time. Now, what kind of general would look at his army and say, I want to lead you into this no-win situation? Or he's here. I want to lead you into this situation in your life where there's no out. I'm going to lead you into this valley where the enemy's totally encompassed it and there's no way you can win. That's not how he works. Amen. So if, he is, if, we're, if we're being led, Romans tells us this, his spirit bearing witness with our spirit. If we're being walking spirit-led, then we're walking into a place where we can win. Now, don't misunderstand me. You may walk right into the middle of a place and look around and be like, I'm totally surrounded about, and it looks as though in the natural there's no way I can win, but here's the deal. God told me to get here, so he's made provision in a way that apparently I can destroy every one of these enemies that are around me. Can you see the difference? We, we, we have to look at it like it may look this way, but I've been being spirit-led and walking after the spirit in everything I do, and I know that I know that I'm following him, and I've walked into this place by his leading, so it don't matter how many devils are around. I win because he doesn't lead me into no-win situations. Amen. But now if I get, if I just get walking and I heard so-and-so went down there and dealt with the devil and I heard so-and-so started this type of ministry and I just want to steer my ship to look like that, I'm getting away from the plan. I'm not being spirit-led. I'm being soul-led because my mind, my will, and emotions wants to see those things, wants to be a part of those things. And now I'm walking over here and I look up and I'm totally encompassed about by the enemy and I'm right in the middle of a place of no-win situation because God's like, I didn't ordain that. That's not my plan. That's not my purpose for you. You're trying to mimic or act like somebody else or you're just out there doing your own thing, trying to work the gifts or trying to work the word and not do the word. And now you're surrounded. <laughs> Have we been there? <laughs> oh, we've been there, haven't we? We've been there where we looked around, we're surrounded and there's, but here's, God's mercy is what? New every morning. This morning, if you walk by the soul and you got into a place you shouldn't be with, understand that his mercy and grace will, has made a way where you can back out. Now, you may get in there like this and be like, wait a minute, I'm out. I'm not where I should be. And you may have to back out. You ever had to back out of a situation? I can tell a story. I was deer hunting one time. Uh, years ago, right? At, remember when the tornado went through here and went through Sims and, and destroyed all that? We went through two or three places I hunt and just destroyed the woods. And I, I never take a light when I go in in the dark. I, I had one guy ask me, he said, my lens, was you raised by wolves? I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I can't see nothing and you're just walking. I was like, well, I know where I'm at. Hey, man, I know where I'm at. I don't need a light. I know where I'm going. He didn't know where he's going. He's from Texas with me. And uh, anyway, he wasn't with me in this instance, but I was, I was, I was going to go right through the middle of that tornado mess, just treetops and brush twisted up, 
because I didn't want to go around it, and my place where I wanted to hunt was right on the other side of it. But I hadn't been through there. I knew it was bad. I drew, drove past it with a four-wheeler, and I was like, that's bad. But I can get through there in the dark. So I'm in the dark crawling. You know how you get in the middle of, well, some of you may not, but anybody that's hunted, you get in a, a certain place. It's like there's, if I move left, right, up, down, there's nowhere to go. I'm stuck, and I'm trying to work my way through this treetop, and I'm all bent over, and I'm bent over in total black darkness of the morning, and all of a sudden, I was in the treetop with something. <laughs> I could not identify it because I couldn't see it, and I've never heard that sound before or since. I wish I had a light so I could tell you what it was. I don't know if it was a coon, a coyote, a badger, or I don't know what it was, but it was making something that sounded like it come right out of a Freddy Krueger show. And I've never watched Freddy Krueger, but that would be my guess. And it sounded like it was about five to six feet from my face. And I remember being like this, and I backed out. <laughs> I remember I, I held my bow in front of me like, maybe if it attacks, it'll take this first and I can get out of this mess. So glory to God, when, when you're out there and you've went to the wrong place, back out. Back out of it. Some of us be like, well, I made this choice and because and it, it, looks, it, looks, it looks bad, doesn't it, to, to your peers to back out. It's hard on the ego when you've told people, I'm going down there to show people what God is like, <laughs> or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to take that job, or I'm going to do this, and it wasn't walking in the spirit, it was being led by the soul, and it's hard on the, especially us males, it's hard on the male ego, and I've heard this one time, it said the male ego has got more males killed, more men killed than almost anything. Because he'd rather die. <laughs> Most of us would rather die as say, this is not the right choice. <laughs> right? So they stay. Now listen to this. Get this in your, your spirit walk, your, your, your word walk with God. You're walking out the plan. If you walk out there into that place... And your spiritual ego is so big that you can't back out. Heath, again, Heath calls it crawdadding. You know why they call it crawdadding? Because crawdads go everywhere in reverse. <laughs> Heath was going to help me with something one time. And he, he didn't show up. He said, I'm sorry, I crawdadded on you. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, I backed out. <laughs> If your spiritual ego is so big once you've walked out into that, that your plan and not his plan that you don't back out, you'll die there. Many people have died there. And then we've preached beautiful little messages that tickle the ears and say God had to take them. No, they got out of the plan. And they walked out there and they may at some point and some time looked around and said, this does nothing, this isn't it, I'm surrounded on every side. But what would I tell Pastor Bill? What would I tell those people that I announced that I'm going to do this? And I tagged on to it. God told me. And, I, and you won't back out. You won't come back and say, I was wrong. I'm out of it now. Let me get back over here. Help me. This is what the body of Christ does. Bandage me up. Help me. Uphold me in prayer for a little bit. And so I can get my feet back under me and then get back on the plan. And his mercy was new this morning for that. His mercy was new today for you to leave your way and get back with his plan. Amen. Isn't that good? Amen. Yeah, there's, there's, there's people gone. There's marriages split. There's children and families fighting. This is how important it is to live in the Spirit. I told you, was it last week? They've called me that. They called me that at AirTex. I even had good friends call me. Hyper-spiritual. Good friends say, we're really concerned about you. <laughs> I said, concerned about me? Well, we heard you left down there, and you're going to Church of the Harvest. Oh, okay. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> we're really praying for you. Well, keep praying. I'll take your prayer. 
because it's out of line with the Word of God, then it's just going to come over here and bounce off of me. Amen? <laughs> We're really concerned about you. We heard they're hyper-spiritual down there. And we heard they're hyper-faith. And I tell you my story all the time. I found in the Bible hyper-faith. And I found right here that you've got to walk in the Spirit. So that means the more I live and walk in the Spirit, the more easy it is for me to receive and hear from the Spirit of God. And He's going to lead me into a place that I can't win. He's leading me into victory, glory after glory. What's the Bible say? From glory to glory, from strength to strength. That's the way He leads. And it may look with the natural eye. I told you, I said, people, since, well, since we left my dad's church, and headed to Assembly of God in McLeansboro. People looked at me and started being like, that don't make no sense. And if you start making your decisions based upon other people's way of thinking, you will not get in God's plan for your life. They're well-meaning people, but they're going to look at you and be like, don't go down there. They're hyper. Why would you ever leave your dad's church? He's a pastor. He's got a nice little church there. If you'd stay there several years, you're called to the ministry. You could help take over that work and, and, and stand in there for him and, and, and that, all that stuff. And ain't that the way it's supposed to be? Father, take over a son's work? Well, it can be, but that may not be. I could have done that just for doing's sake. It wouldn't have been right. Amen. I'm preaching better than your amen. -ing. He's going to cause me to win. If I stay on the plan, I will win. And his plan can only be discerned by the Spirit. And the Spirit can only be understood by the Word. And the Word, listen, can only be understood with the help of the Spirit. You see, they're working together. They're working together. And you're only going to get those things out of that book. I hate to just call it a book, but you're only going to receive the revelation of those things off those pages by the Spirit. Oh, we can teach out of our head. And we can teach out of just reading it. And there's theologians out there that can quote it far better than me. We can do all those things. But you'll set up an organization and a tradition, and it'll be set up after the rudiments of the world, and you'll find yourself on a YouTube podcast knocking of a revival. You'll find yourself talking about how off this person is and how off that group is and how wrong this person is. That's religion because that's what they did to Jesus. The religious leaders, the theologians, the scholars, they looked at Jesus and said, he's off, he's wrong, he's doing things by the spirit of the devil. Man, I had so much more I was going to preach on. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine more scriptures to go on. And I dare not start reading them because we'll be here for a long time. There's just so much there. Amen. Where was we? Proverbs 20. It's your spirit. And you can't be too spiritual. That's a bunch of fooey from the world. It doesn't mean you're going to be weird. It don't mean you just turn into a weirdy. I don't think I turned into a weirdy after I come to Church of the Harvest. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now you may think some of the things I do is weird. But praise the Lord, he's leading me by still waters, and he's leading me into green pastures, and he's leading me into places that I'm going to win. I mean, you can buy an old hundred-year-old house that's fallen in. That's what I'm doing right now. And I'm sure people's looked at it and been like, that's the stupidest thing. You got that pretty place over there, and you got more room, and life is good. And, but the Holy Ghost said sell it. Part of the plan. So if I go with the plan, the next stage is only going to get gooder. It's only going to get better. Amen? Stand up with me. Well, I would love to just preach for another hour, but I can't do it. Hallelujah. So Paul prayed for the spirit, he prayed for the soul, and he prayed for the body. And you should model your prayers. When you're praying for yourself, 
Anybody pray for their self? I venture to say most of us pray for ourselves more than anything else if we're not careful. There are times, yes, you pray for yourself and your situations. When you do that, it would behoove you just to start out. Lord, I'm, gonna, I'm addressing today my spirit. I'm bringing my spirit. I'm bringing my soul. I'm bringing my body. I'm going to pray about all three of them. <laughs> and I go back to what I said, how this helped me and Kristen so much. These, these teachings on spirit, soul, and body, walking in the spirit, learning how to be led and living in the spirit, how it helped us so much is it's real simple. It's like that old saying, I said all that to say this, you'll find out who's speaking. Amen. You know what I'm saying? You're going to begin to be able to distinguish what part of you is speaking. Amen. You're going to begin to distinguish that. And I, I want to look at people and be like, don't tell me you're being spirit-led when, when you ain't been to church for three months. And, 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 and if you can't even get yourself in the corporate body, uh, what I mean, maybe you are, but how am I supposed to believe that you're doing what you're doing out there, everything? And I'm not preaching condemnation. I'm just saying. Because it's tough. Ah, I got to stop. I want to preach again. It's it is tough to be spirit-led when you're not being part of the body, when you're a lone ranger out there. Amen. I'll leave that one alone for now. <laughs> Where's Ashley? Is she here? Come play for me. Help me find a place to end this. Isn't God good? The part of you that is made new is your spirit. The part of you that was born again, when you give your heart to Jesus and the Holy Ghost come, is your spirit. You ever think about, you know, as a kid, I used to be like, this said, Jesus come. Jesus come and, and he's going to live on the inside of you. I was like, I was only four foot tall or so maybe when I was a kid thinking about that and I was like how's he gonna get in there he's surely taller than me right <laughs> he don't fit but I was you know as a little kid I'm thinking about Jesus getting in my inside of my flesh and there's no way I mean if you got some outside thing inside your flesh we call that a parasite don't we you need to get that addressed and get it out of there <laughs> take some wormer or something <laughs> It's your spirit. This is the capacity of the spirit man on the inside of you that he's so big, he's so huge, he's so large that God himself can inhabit and live in your spirit. Golly gee, as Pastor Bill used to say, when you begin to think about that, the, the bigness and the vastness of God can come and be on the inside of you. It's your spirit that he's in. You're born of him by the Spirit. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning for everybody in this place that were born again. I pray that if they're not, they would come forward and let me join with them in prayer. That they would have Jesus on the inside, the Holy Spirit within them, God's own Spirit residing. That their dead spirit could be made new by the Spirit. And then they'd begin to live and walk this spirit life out. Thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for it, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, as I pray that, if you want prayer, come ahead and pray with me. Sometimes we just assume that everybody's born again in a church this size, but they may not be. Some of us may have been way out there in left field. We may have one time, but we've walked out there and we want to do what I was talking about in that brush pile. We need to back out of where we're at and let's get back in the plan. God is not going to bless something that's not his plan. Can you see that? Amen. We'll wait just a little bit. This is a part where I miss Kristen. Me along the way. Amen. Well, let's just pray for a moment. Father, we love you. We 
thank you. Hallelujah. Maybe just corporately, everybody pray for just a moment. Hallelujah. Help us to figure this out, Lord. James 1, 21. It says, for, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. This is how I want to end. If you've asked Jesus to come into you, your spirit is born again. I've said this before, James is writing to believers here, and he's telling them that they need to get their souls saved. Isn't that interesting? So here he's saying, how do I do that? I lay some things aside and receive this word. There's another place, is it Romans, that tells us that the washing of the word or the renewing of the mind, be ye transfer, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember what I said. My buddy Heath taught me this. But tell me what I need to do. Tell me how to do it. How do you save that soul, man? You've got to spend some time with the Word. He needs a bar of soap rubbed on him every day. Whether it's you sitting down just reading, 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 however you flow. Or you just getting up reading one and meditating or meditating it all day and speaking it. Different people flow different ways. Man, sometimes I just get up and it's just a, a passage or two, and that's just that's just my day all day. I just chew and 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 eat on that all day. And what I, what am I doing? I'm saving my soul. I'm saving my soul. I think it was Wigglesworth again that said, you know, you get born again in an instant. I could be wrong. Someone said this, I heard it one time. You get born again in an instant. But you got to spend the rest of your life getting saved. Amen. Renewing the mind. Everybody good? All right. I don't know how to end other than come ahead. We're going to hear from an important person. <laughs> I just had it in my heart to remind us all. Pastor Kristen exhorted us on Wednesday night to pray, each one of us pray in the spirit at least 10 minutes a day for ourselves. Because I know as a mom and a wife, you know, I, I'm, I'm all about my family and I want to pray for them. But we got to remember, you know, that I was saying, if you're in a plane that's going down, put your own air mask on first. Yeah, yeah. And so I just want to exhort us and encourage us, all of us, to pray 10 minutes. If you're, if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, Praying in other tongues. Um, could you put up Jude 120, please? You know, it says pray in the most in the Holy Ghost. Build yourself up. Because uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says when we pray in the Spirit, we're speaking mysteries to God. Ye beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Ghost. That's what that praying in tongues does. And, you know, we put our armor on before we do that. And if you ever have questions, um, my name's Winnie Braddock. Get a hold of me on Facebook. I don't get on there much, except I do like to check there for messages from people in the church. But um, we got to be built up in these last days. And one other thing is, um, you know, plead the blood of Jesus over your families. I'm sure you do that. I want to encourage us to do it because we're in the last days. Plead the blood of Jesus over yourself and your family and, you know, put your armor on. But then also teach your children to uh, 
confess Psalm 91. Can you put Psalm 91 one? You know, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the power of the Almighty, whose power no folk can withstand. But we know faith has a part. Mm -hmm. Faith says something. It's not enough to read it. Um, okay, if you will go under the next one. Um, Psalm 91 2. Let's look at that. I will say, this is it, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. And, you know, we personalize it. When I do it, I do all of Psalm 91, and I do it over my family, over my kids, their spouses, my grandkids. But we need to teach our children because they aren't going to be with us 24-7. And they don't have to say all of Psalm 91, but I just exhort us to teach your kids to say, Lord, you are my refuge. Or they don't have to say it exactly like that. You are my fortress. I trust in you. Say that out loud every day. They can word it however it speaks to them. But you know, and then after we say that, he delivers us from all this that's in this world. Um, so I just encourage us to pray in the Holy Ghost 10 minutes a day for starters to pray for yourself. And um, if you need any encouragement in that, message us or call, you know, Pastor Kristen or myself or. Um, any of us, you know, because we're a church and we're a body and we want to do this together. We must do this together. We need everybody. But I encourage us again. I didn't want to take up time, but Amen. pray in the Holy Ghost. That's and right. Teach your kids to say, Lord, I trust in you. You are my God, my shield, my fortress. They don't have to say all that, but they need to say out loud, even your little ones. As, as, if they can say a sentence, they need to start saying that every morning. I trust in you, God. Amen. You better listen to that lady. Pastor Bill says she might be the reason this is all here. Because she started praying, send me somebody that can help me with this. Quit, tell me what I need to do and show me how to do it. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you. We're going to do that this week. We're going to pray in the Spirit. We're going to confess Psalms 91. We're going to walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit. Hallelujah. And you're going to lead us right into the place we're supposed to be, when we're supposed to be, with the people we're supposed to be, doing the right thing. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we love you. Just have a wonderful day. Come back Wednesday night and pray. And college is over here and youth where they're supposed to be tonight. <laughs>